can't buy It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders you've heard of and some you've never heard of. You know, P90X founder Tony Horton talks about, John, how he made um, money as a street miner. Before he sold hundreds of millions of dollars, he put his hat on the street, and that's how he made his food and rent money. Um, Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark talks about growing her company um, to $20 million with five employees, selling to Disney. The most impressive part was she beat cancer twice and kind of the journey. And Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about how when he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. The most impressive of everyone, John, is uh, Chris Atigeka. No one's ever heard of him. Most people haven't. He founded two nonprofits, two for-profits. He grew up in Uganda at seven years old. He became an orphan because both his parents died of AIDS. And he was the oldest of five children. He became the head of the household. His brother died on the way to the hospital, and that's why he started one of his nonprofits. Uh, Just a a crazy, amazing story, crazy in the most positive sense. He wore his first pair of shoes at 17, took his first flight at 22. He went on, speaks nine languages, and he went to the U.S. for college, went on to get his Ph.D. while running his companies. Amazing. Um, This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, and... At Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And what we do is we create a systemized incoming refer- I'm talking to one of the godfathers of podcasting, by the way, who's been podcasting since 2005. But we create a systemized incoming referral pipeline, which generates ROI using a podcast. And um, it's been the best thing I've done for my business and my life. And it's much more personal for me because it's not just about your business. It's about you leaving a legacy. And it was inspired by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor, and his brother and him were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and they were the only members of their family to survive. And his words and legacy live on because of an interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him, which you can watch on my About page. So yes, podcasting will help your business, but it really, you don't realize how much of a legacy of knowledge it leaves. And um, so if you have questions, I think every business should have a podcast. Um, and I say that before it was self-serving, John. But um, if you have questions, go to rise25.com or support at rise25media.com if you have questions. And I'm excited to introduce today's guest, John Jantz. Um, he's a marketing consultant, speaker, best-selling author. Um, check out all of his books. Um, we're going to talk about his latest one, but Duct Tape Marketing, it's, it's legendary. You know, it's really um, up there with the best business books. And the referral engine, he wrote Duct Tape Selling, the Commitment Engine, SEO for Growth, and the newest one, and whenever you're listening to this, it's the Self-Reliant Entrepreneur, and it's 366 Daily Meditations to Feed Your Soul and Grow Your Business. And he poured, what I love about books, John, everyone should buy this book. I'm going to get it on Audible for sure. It's like 30 plus years of wisdom and experience <laughs> into a book, and like, what do you pay like 20 or $30 really for your, your wisdom and you, you gleaning all this knowledge. So it's, it's a no brainer. Each page is meant to be read in a few minutes and it contains an inspiring quote followed by a reflection and then a challenging question. My favorite part is that challenging question. If you just put a challenging question, on every page worth the price of admission right there. Um, John has also been podcasting. Like I mentioned since 2005, check out duct tape marketing podcast. John, thanks for joining me. Absolutely, I appreciate you sharing. And I've, you know, I, I share that sentiment I, I, about books. Um, you know, there people drop twelve hundred dollars on courses that are basically a distillation of somebody's fourteen ninety five book. You know, half the time, um, it, it really they are. I think the absolute bargains um, out there in terms of yeah. education. Totally bargain, totally bargain. So I appreciate you pouring your your time, energy, and soul into this book and what we'll talk about it. And, you know, I want to start by talking about the title, Self-Reliant Entrepreneur, because, you know, I think where the title really comes from, and you may agree or disagree with this, you are one of 10 kids. Like, (laughs) okay, subconsciously, you have to be self-reliant, right? They probably, 
like John, yeah, feed yourself. Like we don't have time. We have 10 yeah. kids. Talk about growing up in a household, being one of 10 kids. And I know your grandma was an inspiration and almost behind what you produced. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been, you've been doing your research. Good on you. But uh, the, uh, uh, not only 10 children, but seven brothers. Uh, so, you know, eight boys, two girls. And so there was a survival element uh, to growing up in, in that. There's absolutely, you know, no, no question about that. I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, it, it definitely did a, a self-reliant in, in the sense of like being able to survive on your own. I mean, it, my mom, you know, I was a seventh kid. By the time I came along, it was important that, that my mom um, taught me how to cook and do my own laundry uh, because, you know, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was a way to contribute to, you know, what needed to be done. Um, and, and I think that that's probably, um, uh, I think that's probably lessons that everybody should still, <laughs> to, you know, regardless of the size of family, but it was certainly very, very practical. And then the, I'll, I'll, the grandmother mention was that my uh, grandmother for 50 years worked for, uh, the unity church, uh, which is based in Kansas city. Um, and one of their big missions was uh, something called the daily word. And uh, so people would subscribe, or I think that in the early days, they probably gave them away. But, uh, you know, we, we would always dutifully get a subscription to the Daily Word, uh, um, you know, every Christmas <laughs> from my uh, uh, grandmother. And, and that, it, you know, the format, you know, bears some resemblance uh, to, the, to this book. I mean, it was a word each day. And then, you know, ge generally there was some scripture reflection in that, uh, uh, obviously. But uh, the concept, I think, uh, is very similar. It was meant to just be kind of a small dose of inspiration. Joe, what, what's a story you remember, one of your favorite stories from growing up that you know, <laughs> illustrates how probably hectic the household was or from, you know, from growing up? One story that, and you know how sometimes in, in families, you know, stories started at like this and then they become legend <laughs> and myth and, you know, but there was legendary myth. <laughs> there, there was a story that is told quite often by my siblings that, my, uh, and my mom, I remember her saying this, uh, said that, you know, if you imagine taking 10 kids anyway, anywhere, anywhere, you know, there was oh, only 14 years yeah. between us. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it was a spectacle. And, and apparently, like once a year, maybe, they would take us all to the grocery store. Um, and um, the, the, the word was that uh, my mom would say, you know, Dad, you watch John, I'll watch the other night. <laughs> so that's sort of telling, maybe. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it is. Um, and so I want to talk about the book in like the themes and, and yeah. why you chose the themes you did. But before we do, can you give people kind of a quick timeline just of um, the jobs career wise, just quickly, a quick overview of where you started to take us up to the present? Well, in some ways, it's a pretty short story. Um, I, right out of college, I went to work for an ad agency, did that for about five years and learned that I wanted to do my own thing. That was 30 years ago. Uh, I started my own marketing consulting firm. Uh, tr admittedly, it was like, what do you need? I can do that. <laughs> you know, kind of hustle project work. There was no sort of plan to build an empire or, you know, or even a business, really. I didn't call myself an entrepreneur. I just figured I could hustle work. Um, and that, you know, a few years in kind of morphed into me realizing I wanted to work with small business owners. And, uh, you know, that eventually led to me kind of, you know, there were several, uh, it was, we didn't call them pivots, you know, at the time, but there were several, you know, kind of moves where that I made that turned into duct tape marketing that then turned into publishing that then turned into me teaching, you know, other marketing consultants, uh, how to, how to work with small business owners. So, uh, ultimately I've had my business for, for three decades, um, in, probably at least six or seven shades of, you know, focus. What made you decide to start podcasting? I mean, no one didn't even know what podcasting was. In yeah. So, so, so I'd stumbled on this blog thing in 2002. Um, and so that, that really got me into the whole online, you know, technology marketing space. And, you know, podcasting was one of these things that came along a couple of years later and people were talking about it. It was going to be the, it was going to replace blogs. Um, of course, that was kind of always the first you know, iteration of a lot of things, but it was really hard for people to actually listen. Um, they had to have special technology. We called them pod catchers. I don't know if I'm really dating myself with terms like that, but um, they, they actually had to have special technology. You had to teach them how to actually listen to it. 
So I think podcasting, you know, at that, I, I, I got into it because in some ways it was a new technology. It was, you know, I was heavily into blogging. People were saying this is the next blogging. So, you know, I wanted to be there, but I pretty quickly learned that, you know, my, my first three or four interviews were, you know, Guy Kawasaki and Seth Godin and um, Robert Shield, the deal. How do you say his Gildini, name? Yeah. Gildini. <laughs> Sorry, Robert, if you're listening. Um, and, and, you know, it, immediately it was like, Hey, I sent these guys an email and they all said, yes, <laughs> you know, they never heard of me. Uh, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that to me, you know, before I had any listeners, I thought, well, this is, this is like my way to be the media um, and, and contact people. And, and so I've, you know, continued to do it now thousands of shows later uh, for the same reason. Yeah. Amazing show. You got some amazing guests on and you also, I forgot to mention the service you have podcast bookers. Yeah. You talked about everybody should have a podcast. I've been saying that for years, you know, because even the the local attorney or, you know, management consultant, you know, they don't have to be interviewing, you know, famous authors or whatever, you know, we might, totally. might call ourselves. They should interview prospects, you know, people that are people that have succeeded doing what they are, their clients want to do. Not only is it great content, it just it elevates your game. I mean, some of those people are going to turn around and go, well, tell me more about what you do, because they, they're not getting asked to be on podcasts, you know, like like people that are in the podcast world. So it, it's just a great strategy. Yeah. People think of it as like, oh, you need to go to these, these major authorities, but who the like local restaurant owner, no one's asking them to be featured. Um, I just want to point out a couple of your top episodes people should check out in Duct Tape Marketing. You know, you've had Simon Sinek, Robert Cialdini, which you mentioned, Michael Hyatt, Jonah Berger, Sally Hogshead, um, Chip Heath, legendary author, um, one of my favorite books, uh, Made to Stick. Mm -hmm. So check that out. Um, theme, the themes. Um, you know, what's cool about your book is you break down the themes and then each month has a theme, but there's kind of yeah. overarching four themes of the seasons. And I want to talk about how you came to this. You have planning, discovering, evolving, and growing. Um, I'm sure you spent a lot of time mapping out why, you know, these particular themes. Um, I, 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 in, one, in one hand, I spent a lot of time. I didn't sit there and reflect on it. It was really me sort of observing my experience. And that's what a lot of this book is, mm -hmm. is me kind of reflecting on my, my experience. And I, I, I can clearly point to a number of times uh, in my life where my entrepreneurial life, where I have felt that I've gone through a change, which made me have to have to think about, okay, do I trust this idea? <laughs> you know, is this, is this the right uh, you know, thing? Um, you know, is there purpose and meaning in this, you know, as I move forward? Okay, it didn't exactly work how I thought it was going to. So how do I shift it a little bit? Um, and then ultimately, hey, this is going to work, you know, now, like, who's going to, you know, who's going to feel the impact of this? And, and that's kind of, that was a really short sort of thread of what I think are the ever-changing seasons, uh, if you stay in this long enough. Um, most of us, you know, very few people, I think, start, get an idea, you know, build this amazing business and then come to the end of it and go, you know, I've, I've made my dent in the universe, you know. <laughs> I, I think we do that multiple times. And, and because I organized the book um, as a uh, book, obviously the season metaphor was certainly there uh, for the taking. I, I will tell you that from a practical standpoint, um, the themes, uh, while, while I felt like they were appropriate themes for the season, they also helped me organize uh, the, all of the research that I did because that, I just started reading everything and then realized, wait a minute, if I'm going to I'm going to collect 400 thoughts here to, to, to anchor the pages. I better, I better have a structure. Yeah. Start with the first one, the planning piece. And that makes sense as far as the first of the year, you should do the planning. Yeah. Um, and then you have the, you know, broken down like January is trust, February is creativity, March is freedom. Um, out of the, the planning section, what should people think about as far as um, going into the new year? You know, yeah. it's kind of a cool, you know, people think about goals and everything like this, but this is really a daily practice that people yeah. do. Yeah, and that's that's a great point. I mean, this is not a book people take on vacation and come back and go, okay, I've got some really great ideas. I mean, some people might read it that way, but it's, uh, it is, uh, you, you nailed the word. I call it a practice as much as anything, and hopefully it fits into something you're already doing um, as kind of a sort of centering uh, practice in the morning. But um, 
in terms of your question about what people should be doing, I mean, this, this is a typical time of year that um, maybe you look back and say, okay, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what should we keep, what should we not keep? But I always like to think in terms of, of you know, one of the things that, especially in the, the, the work that I'm in, it just feels like so much stuff changes. I mean, when I started offering uh, marketing consulting to, uh, you know, a systematic approach to building a marketing consulting business, the Duct Tape Marketing Network, nobody else was doing that. Um, now it's the hottest business going. <laughs> you, know, you look on LinkedIn or Facebook, I mean, everybody is selling, you know, I'm going to help you build your digital agency. So, you know, this is the time of year that, you know, you know, maybe in hindsight can look back and go, wow, you know, it's gotten harder to sell what I was selling. You know, how do we need to, how do we need to refresh or reposition, you know, what it is we're doing? And I, I think increasingly, you know, that's something that we have to do probably more often than we used to. Yeah. I figured, you know, we could maybe take one excerpt from each of the themes. You could just choose whatever month um, just to give people an idea. So on the planning theme, um, if there's, uh, choose whichever, you know, January is trust, February is creativity, March is freedom. Um, maybe let's just do one of whichever, whatever you turn to just to give people a sense. <laughs> okay. I just, uh, I, I propped up, you want me to read it? Yeah, yeah, read it. The entire yeah. entry. Okay. So I propped up, uh, January 27th, um, and it is, uh, towards the end of the trust uh, chapter. And really, you know, these pages don't just overtly talk about trust necessarily. I I think they circle around the topic quite often. Um, and really a lot of what um, my point about trust is, um, th this idea that you have to trust yourself enough, you know, to stay on course because uh, there are a lot of things that, that, that want to knock you off course. There's a lot of things you can't control. <laughs> and so I, I think where people sometimes get in trouble is that they, they haven't wrestled with this idea that, yeah, this is what I believe in. This is where I'm going. You know, a lot of times it's, it's this, Oh, look, you know, there's an opportunity over there. That's the next big thing. Um, and I think that's where people get in trouble is, you know, maybe they, maybe they build a business out of that. Maybe it goes away, you know, but it, because it wasn't really based in something that made sense uh, to, to them or, you know, fully. So gracefully, every day has a, um, a title, then a reading from uh, um, the literature that I chose, and then uh, my 150 words or so in a question. So January 27th, gratefully uncomfortable. The power which resides in us is new in nature, and none but we know what that is which we can do, nor do we know until we have tried. Not for nothing one face, one character, one fact makes much impression on us, and another none. It is not without pre-established harmony, this sculpture in my memory. The eye was placed where one ray should fall, that it might testify of that particular ray. It's from that Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, Self-Reliance, written in 1841. Hmm. Comfort may indeed be one of the greatest adversaries of the entrepreneur. The moment we begin to feel we deserve something, get used to things being a certain way, or expect to be treated as though we are more important than another, is the moment we start to fade. Hmm. Entitlement creates stagnation and constrains the flow of nature in our lives. You might actually play with this idea and find occasion to make yourself uncomfortable. It's not so much about being uncomfortable as it is about being comfortable with how it makes you feel. You can do something very simple, like take a new way home or something slightly more complex, like present a new idea to a room full of people you don't know. Look for instances that make you irritated and observe why you're feeling this way. Travel is a great everyday irritant for some and presents a great opportunity for witnessing and accepting inconvenience in a gracious manner. We take so much for granted when we strive to achieve that we forget just how great we have it. You're always in charge of the moments you choose to think, feel, and act about something. And true self-reliance means accepting almost everything as neither good nor bad. Hmm. And the Your challenge like question for today is... When is the last time you gratefully accepted being uncomfortable? Hmm. It's, it's a hard one. <laughs> it's funny. The um, people seem to have their, their favorite uh, 
components. You know, a lot of people like the readings that I chose. Um, a lot of people say, oh, no, you, you really made those readings, you know, real for me. And then there are people that are fans of the questions. And that's, I suppose that's one of the beauties of the format uh, from, from an author's standpoint is that uh, people can come to it in, uh, with different appreciations. Totally. My order of favorite <laughs> is reverse order. I love the question. Yeah. I love your interpretation and then the quote. You know, if you just had the question in your interpretation, I would love it just as much. Um, <laughs> but it, it really, you know, lends itself obviously to the to, to the classics and you know, in in that age old knowledge. Yeah, and they're, they're, I've definitely heard from some literature, uh, self-proclaimed literature nerds, you know, who are like, yeah, this, you really went deep into some of this stuff, you know, and un uncovered some authors that we'd not heard of uh, from a, you know, pretty tight uh, band in history. Who are some of the authors throughout that you, I know Ralph Waldo Emerson's a big one. Who are some of the other ones that... Uh, yeah. So, so essentially, I, I mined uh, literature that was mostly written from about 1840 to, there's a few that leak into like the 19, early 1900s, but for the most part, it was really right around the Civil War, uh, around the abolition of slavery, around the, uh, um, the ability for women to actually uh, get the vote, um, uh, that a lot of this literature was produced. And uh, the reason I chose that is because uh, the, the overarching theme of a lot of that literature was kind of counterculture. It's like, hey, Maybe we don't have to listen to our preacher or our parents or, you know, the government. Maybe we need to start thinking for ourselves. It was kind of the first literature or first time in American literature where that theme was, was very pronounced. And, and certainly from people like Emerson and Thoreau, it was, you know, very overt. Uh, but, but as I dug in, you know, even a lot of the classic um, fiction that we were asked to read, you know, Little Women and Scarlet Letter and Moby Dick, it was kind of the first time you had a protagonist who was portrayed as very much, you know, this may cost me, but I have to follow my heart. Um, and, and so uh, I, I just happen to think that, that, you know, it wasn't written for entrepreneurs, but I think it's some of the best entrepreneurial advice uh, uh, out there. And so that's, as I curated the, the literature, including their letters and journals and things like that, you know, that's what I was looking for was, was themes that I thought applied to uh, today's entrepreneur. Yeah, I think what's cool about the book too is like, like you said, you can kind of choose your own adventure with it. If you decide yeah. to look at the page and just go with the question or just go with your interpretation or just go with the quote, you'll still get a lot out of it. Um, the, so the next theme is the discovering thing, you know, April, May, June, love, commitment, security. Um, maybe you could just read a question, one of the questions on one of the pages. Okay. Um, so people can get a sense. <laughs> so... Uh, this is April 7th, um, and the challenge question is, what attribute of love is missing from your mission? Hmm. What attribute of love is missing from your mission? Yeah, now you want the, now you want the context, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You don't think <laughs> Do you want me to read it? Yeah, please. All right, April 7th, in one word. The cure for all the ills and wrongs, the cares, the sorrows and crimes of humanity all lie in that one word, love. It is the divine vitality that produces and restores life. To each and every one of us, it gives the power of working miracles, if we will. Uh, that was written by a woman named Lydia Maria Child. Hmm. So how, do, how does one define the word love? Ah, and the greater challenge, is it even appropriate to use in the context of business? If indeed the cure uh, for all or even some ills and wrongs is the goal of your journey, then perhaps expanding your relationship with the word love does make sense. Not in the romantic sense, but in the humanity sense. Do you know what makes you take risks? What creates connection? What inspires? These are all ideas that help entrepreneurial ventures soar, and they're all based in some sort of love. Love takes courage. Love takes wisdom. Love takes honesty. Love takes loyalty. Love takes, so maybe it does have a place in business. Hmm. So what attribute of love is missing from your mission? You know, what's interesting about that, John, is that, um, you know, I've heard you, when I did my research, you know, you always go back to the client or customer and, and hmm. like everything is really focused around that. Like, why are you doing whatever, Twitter, why are you doing a book or why are you doing podcasting? And it goes back to how to serve the client or customer. Um, 
why did you decide to serve small businesses? I think arguably it could be one of the toughest yeah. jobs actually with all of the questions and probably the handholding and the change. Why small business? <laughs> I, I think in a lot of ways, I initially saw them as underserved or not served at all. <laughs> you know, no, but especially when it was harder to reach them, um, you know, nobody was really trying. Um, but I, I, I go back to a story that, uh, um, that that may or may not have been the turning point, but it, it certainly makes a point. Um, you know, when somebody who writes the check is also the person you're doing the work for, you know, there's kind of equal parts gratifying and terrifying <laughs> about that. But uh, I, in my early days, I was doing project work and I was, I did some work for a very, very large company. The name doesn't matter, but uh, the, you know, the invoice I sent them for the project was something like $1,200 or something. And I got a check for uh, 125,000 blah, 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 dollars. Um, and I was like, uh, now I, I get to turn this back to him. I <laughs> can't catch this. Um, but I called him up and I said, like, how do I do this? And, you know, they sent me all this like stuff that I had to do <laughs> in order, you know, to return this mistake, you know, and I was like, I wonder if anybody would have even missed that money, <laughs> you know, and uh, that was kind of the point where I said, you know, I just want to work with people where I can really look them in the eye and say, hey, this is going to make your life better. You would think that turning point would shift you in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Wait, maybe I shouldn't be doing the small business thing. Yeah, maybe what I should have done is turn around and send them an invoice for that amount of money, and somebody would have just stamped it, and then I would have been okay. But you'd be like, anyway. actually, it was one point two million, not <laughs> right. Yeah, you you, you missed the zero on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's that's it's true. When you're serving the person who's writing the check, it is really meaningful because you see the gratification. Um, then the next theme was evolving. How did you choose evolving as a theme? The, the reason I call that evolving is, in, and again, these aren't, you know, these aren't always nice, tidy little like seasons and months and things, but there, there seems to be always this stage when something I was doing, it might just be a new course, it might be a book I was working on, there always was a stage where I felt like, okay, momentum, it's starting to pick up. And that seems to be always the most dangerous time <laughs> for me um, in things wow. because you know, that's when all of a sudden, if something did work, you weren't prepared for it, or you didn't realize it was going to be, you know, this much work or something. Um, and so that's the place where I think one of the month themes is failure. Um, there, that's, that's the place where sometimes, you know, people do fall apart, and they run off the road, and they never get back on. But it's also the point where you see a lot of very successful people who are able to reframe, you know, that mistake or that challenge, you know, it's not as like, I'm dumb or I failed, but as like, okay, this thing didn't work. What did we learn from that? <laughs> you know, and, and that level of resilience, which I think is actually another one of the themes, is, is what has to start showing up there. Hmm. Yeah, because you do have this failure, resilience, and congruence yeah. in there. Do you remember a time where you remember like a, a mistake or failure point or whatever you want to call it, which then turned the seed of opportunity into something really good for you? Um, yeah. One of the things that, that happened pretty early on is I, you know, I saw that I started documenting, you know, my systematic approach to marketing uh, with the eye, with an eye on creating a course, um, which I did uh, create a course that, uh, uh, still somewhere in uh, some people's office, there's this giant three ring binder with some CDs in it. Uh, that, I have a bunch of them right here. I mean, <laughs> that, probably one of yours. <laughs> that that uh, people bought from me. Um, and I was not thinking actually about creating uh, a network of consultants. Uh, that would would actually license. I was just going to sell this to the small business owners and do a little consulting, you know, on my own, and just kind of, you know, build a a content empire. And I actually had um, a couple people I remember, you know, call me and say, you know, we want to be a part of your network. And I was like, what? You know, I don't, I don't even know how to think about that. So, so this wasn't really a, this wasn't really a mistake or a failure, but it was, it was a moment when, you know, I shifted a great deal of my focus and attention 
not because I had this great idea, but because the market literally said, do this. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, again, it wasn't on my grand plan. There were a number of things. I, I knew I was going to write a book. I mean, I just knew that it was obvious I should write a book, you know, but who has time for that? Um, and, you know, I got a couple publishers. I, I had an I had a, a mention in Forbes back when that used to actually be a, a magazine um, that, uh, you know, pointed out this thing called duct tape marketing is the greatest advice for small business. So, all, you know, so after that article was published, I have three publishers uh, contact me and say, we want to publish your book. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I better write one. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm sharing those stories mainly because I, I just think it, you know, sometimes we get, we get really fixated on how stuff's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and for me, a great learning and, and it shows up in multiple times in this book, um, is, is the lesson that, yeah, we, you know, I knew I was going to write a book, uh, I, or at least I knew that was going to be a part of it. I knew I was going to be a speaker. I knew I was going to do certain things. Um, but I didn't really set out to do them. <laughs> you know, I, I set the intention. Um, I went to work on, you know, doing what I thought it took to go those places, um, but I kind of let go a little bit of exactly how it was going to happen because that's where I think we strangle ourselves sometimes is getting so fixed on how everything has to happen. Yeah. I think even, you know, to your point, even if you do, even if you did have a grand plan, it could not matter at all because the market will tell you something different, you know? And like you said, yeah. one of the key things I took out of what you said is you, you had, you were listening to the market. You didn't just shut those people down and go, yeah, that's not what I'm about. I'm doing this content thing. You actually listened to what they were saying. And by listening to the market, you saw another opportunity, right? Yeah, I think so. So, um, so the next, next, uh, season, uh, theme is growing and change impact grace. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I was born in October, so, um, and one of my favorite books of all time, I'd love to hear some of yours, you know, uh, John Wooden, is Wooden, uh, yeah. by John Wooden, and he, he has, we have the same birthday, October 14th, and uh, his also reads kind of like Lessons of Life, Yeah, a very short book, you can get through it in like an hour, um, just like yours, you can kind of page through and just take what you want, you don't need to read it cover to cover. Um, so maybe something from, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, change the theme of October was change, which is, you know, can change on a minute by minute basis sometimes. Should, should we read your birthday yeah, or? Sure. All right. So October 14th. Um, one of the things that uh, was fun for me is there were a lot of uh, female authors that uh, their work was really not, is still today, not really that well known because, you know, they, some, some states didn't allow women in libraries, you know, when <laughs> some of this was, yeah. was, was written. Um, but there were some tremendous uh, female voices that I was able to uncover. And certainly uh, people in academic and in women's studies, you know, are very familiar with these folks, but I was, I, I was not. Um, and so that was kind of fun. So your, your birthday is actually uh, has a quote from a woman named Margaret Fuller, who uh, shows up in this book a lot. And uh, um, I really love some of the stuff that she wrote. So October 14th, creative genius is the heading. I have come prepared to see all of this, to dislike it, but not with stupid narrowness to distrust or distrust or defame. On the contrary, while I will not be so obliging as to confound ugliness with beauty, discord with harmony, and laud and be contented with all I meet when it conflicts with my best desires and tastes, I trust by reverent faith to woo the mighty meaning of the scene, perhaps to foresee the law by which a new order, a new poetry is to be evoked from this chaos. Hmm. So it was, uh, uh, as I said, Margaret Fuller um, in At Home and Abroad, written in 1856. Creative genius is often seen as something that comes to those chosen few who pick up a brush or sit at a piano and craft something so original that duplication is unthinkable. That's the storybook version anyway. The reality is likely closer to something like this. You search high and low for something you want, but when you can't find it, you decide to make it. You wrestle with a creative way to package your offerings. And then one day while reading a work of fiction you brought to the beach, you stumble on the perfect solution in some quirky piece of dialogue between characters. A client asks you why you've always done something a certain way and you can't find a meaningful answer, so you build a new way. That's creative genius. 
That's how the law by which a new order, a new poetry is to be evoked from this chaos. Question everything, tear apart best practices, create unusual pairings, take nothing but a notebook with you on vacation. Creative genius is found in paying attention to what the universe is showing you in all those places you don't go looking for it. Your challenge question, what color best defined you? I read that you know, <laughs> this, this morning, and um, why that question? <laughs> uh, uh, it's hard to write 366 questions, okay, Jeremy? <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to, to tell you the truth, um, I wanted a curveball. I mean, you didn't expect that question, did you? No. I thought about it. Today, <laughs> so it just, it just made you think, like some, something about the creativity about that quote made you think of a different curveball question. I think so. Um, and, and I also, I, you know, maybe it's uh, from being in marketing all these years, but I really, I love color and I love what color says and what color implies and how it makes you feel and <laughs> different colors. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of times, you know, that's a great starting point for, you know, could you define yourself as a color? What color would it be? I think that's a creative way to look at your life. Yeah, I think some of these would be interesting to bring up around the dinner table with families. Yeah, actually, you know, when I read that, I was like, you know, uh, the dinner table of my wife and two daughters, we should, you know, that would be a really interesting question to ask them and in, in what they said. So um, I've had a number uh, of husband and wife entrepreneurs or that maybe loosely work together or something that have said that the, they're using this book that that way because you know, I, I mean, we're all guilty of this. It's like, what'd you do today? I don't know, but I was busy. You know, <laughs> it's kind of the conversation, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what if you did anchor, you know, your discussion around something and my wife and I are doing it. We don't work together, but she's certainly been, um, she's certainly been around in my entrepreneurial journey and uh, it, it's been kind of fun. We read, we get up in the morning and uh, I read it aloud and it's been, um, you know, it's been kind of fun. I think it's a, I think it's a lot of ways. It's uh maybe giving her a little insight into more insight into me. <laughs> um, I hate to make it all about me, it's but, uh, but I, I, you know, because I, you know, I am answering the questions and it's kind of like, huh, we don't talk about that kind of stuff. It seems like we talk about the kids and the grandkids and you know that. Um, so it, it's been kind of fun. And I, and I appreciate you saying that. Cause I think I, I could even see, um, I have a, a, a head of a company that says that, um, you know, they have a kind of company stand up every day and he's reading uh, the page just to say, Hey, you know, think about this team. Totally. Um, what, what sticks out to you about what your wife has said about the book? Is there any particular excerpt or quote or um, question that yeah. sticks out that she has, has gravitated towards? You know, I, th I think what's interesting is um, th this book, you know, has telltale secrets in it about me. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, well, I don't really mean that as deep as it sounds, but some of when I'm writing it, so I'm projecting, you know, it's like, this has been a struggle for me right. um, that I'm writing about here. And we that's why it's, we need most or so. Yeah, so, so it's kind of like, that's why it seems maybe that reading seems so, you know, raw. <laughs> um, and so I, I think what's been kind of interesting for her is she knows those things, you know, mm -hmm. you, the reader don't, but she knows those things and you know, that I struggle with. And so she is very keenly picks up on, yeah, that, that, you know, that is an issue for you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> our, our wives will, my wife will pick out my issues very quickly. Yeah. Um, what, what's something that she picked up on that most people would not have, picked up on from from reading this because she knows you <sighs> let's think of a uh, of an example um it's terrible but ah um There are times when I, there are probably about four or five times when I come off as kind of complaining about social media and about, you know, everything people say there and how like showing up on some list of the top 1000, you know, taxidermies in, you know, Sedalia, Missouri is not really that impressive. And, <laughs> um, 
some of that, you know, some of that's like, well, why wasn't I on that list? Um, <laughs> you know, that uh, I, I think a lot of times the things we complain about, uh, the things that we, you know, gossip about other people, you know, are actually things that we see in ourselves <laughs> that uh, we're not, maybe we're not aware of it. We're not comfortable with it. But um, so some of the times when, when I'm coming off complaining, I, I think she's, uh, she's kind of saying, is there a reason you're complaining about that particular thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're caring too much about certain things. Maybe we should just let go. Yeah. It's got to be a natural thing. Um, <laughs> the other thing I thought was interesting with the book um, was the subtitle. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you spent a lot of time. It's 366 daily meditations to feed your soul and grow your business. I thought the use of daily meditations was interesting because you could have gone with daily business tips. You could have gone with a number. Yeah, of yeah. Why did you choose meditations? Um, there is a, uh, as I'm sure you've picked up on, there is a spiritual component to this book. Um, yeah. And that um, is how I see the writings. They were meditations for me. A lot of people are, uh, first off, a lot of you know, meditation is not a strange thing anymore. It's something that a lot of people uh, do and prescribe and, and have gotten into. And consequently, there there's a host of apps where you can actually listen to, you know, guided meditations. And so uh, when you get your uh, when you get your audio book version of this book, you know, uh, you, you could actually listen to those, you know, daily as and, and almost see them as guided meditations. And I suspect some people will will actually do that. Um, so that. Um, that's, that, that's kind of it for me. And again, it, it, this, you know, like a lot of things, um, this book in some ways fit into a book that I wish I had. Um, and that, you know, I have had a daily morning, you know, ritual practice. And, you know, one of the things I I've always done is read some, you know, passage. It might be from the Bible. It might be from Wayne Dyer, you know, <laughs> might just something that I felt was, was sort of inspirational for me. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the book I tried to write. Yeah. You know, I'm curious also, what are some of your favorite books, authors, um, you know, more present day, yeah. um, you know, I had Wayne Dyer, like a, whatever, 10 set audio cassette tape that I was listening <laughs> to in the car. Um, what are some of those uh, you consider influential to you? Well, I, I have for a long time uh, been a very big fan of Deepak Chopra, um, and you know Wayne Dyer certainly fits in in uh, to that circle. Some quirky writers, I I really like Jack Kerouac. Um, and as I've gone back, I did not read. You know, I was too young when his stuff first came out, but I feel like it's kind of it's, it's in this fifty year anniversary sort of uh, resurgence. Uh, it feels like um, I uh, like Tom Robbins. He's probably a little more obscure uh, that uh, um, still life with woodpecker is probably my, my favorite book of his. Um, and they all tend to be books. I think they all tend to be books where, you know, the characters are, this is going to be really cliche, but sort of self-reliant <laughs> themselves uh, that, you know, going after what not, not like I can go it alone. I don't need anybody, but um but but very much, I have to follow my you know heart, and that may actually give me more empathy for other people doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Totally, thank you. Yeah, I, I read a lot of books. Um, you know, the the Nature Principle uh, is another one I love. There's a uh, the Secret Life of Plants, uh, Zen and the uh, uh, Art of Motorcycle Maintenance has, has uh, been one that I've probably gone back to several times. Uh, there's yeah. there's an amazing book on on that the the uh, secret life of trees uh, that is uh, I've, I've read recently. So, yeah, I heard you talk about that um, when, you know, I was doing my research and I was like, yeah, that I bookmarked that um, cause you were, you're very adamant is one of your favorites. <laughs> um, I always ask John, since it's inspired insider, two questions. One, what's been a low moment, a tough time, and then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment uh, for you? Um, what's been the lower moment, tough time in business? Well, um, when I first started my business, you know, I told you I kind of just went out and hustled whatever work I could get. Um, I, I, I'll give you the short version of this, but at some point um, I received a um, grand jury uh, invitation to come speak in front of a grand jury that was investigating one of my clients for felony racketeering charges. Wow. Um, 
fortunately, you know, they just were going through their whole roster and talking to everybody. Fortunately, I didn't have anything uh, interesting to share, but um, probably the low moment for me was that I knew that they were doing some things that were a little odd, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, but I chose to kind of look the other way because, Hey, you know, I was doing the work. I was being paid to do the work I did. Um, so that was really, in some ways, it was a low moment. Like a lot of people's low moments, it was a turning point as well, because uh, you asked me why I decided to start working with small business owners. Um, that was uh, that was the point at which I said, yeah, that's, you know, I have to help people, not just <laughs> not just get money. Um, and that was a point where I said, I'm, you know, I'm no longer going to work with anybody that I don't respect or trust or, you know, that we don't share, share values. And uh, so, you know, like a lot of moments, I'm sure you've heard from a lot of people They're most, most of the time, uh, if our low moments don't kill us, they turn into something really valuable. Yeah. So it made you kind of solidify almost like core values on who you would work with and who you yeah. were and, and who I was going to try to go after and com- and commit to working with. Yeah. yeah. Even if it meant turning down business, it you was bet. a, you know, it became just something that you would feel good about in the end. Yeah. I, I, I it happened and it happens all the time. And I, I, um, again, no need to name names, but I was uh, offered something very recently that was a lot of money to work with a company that I didn't believe in what they do. And uh, I had to say no. Yeah. Yeah. We had this conversation the other day with one of the our staff and it was like, if anyone doesn't treat you well, we don't want to work with them. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, not yeah. even us. Like if they treat us and not you, then yeah. it's not yeah. something we That's want right. to work with. So, That's right. you know, I appreciate, yeah. The, um, there's a line you have to draw. Um, what about on the flip side? I know you've had a several decade career, so it's hard <laughs> to choose one. But um, what sticks out is is a proud moment for you. Yeah, I think there are probably many, many. In fact, I'm sure there are that, that at least I'm somewhat proud of. But I do remember distinctly the feeling that I got when uh, the UPS uh, uh, guy rolled up a couple boxes of duct tape marketing. It was the first time I'd seen uh, my published book. Um, you know, that was, um, I still get chills thinking about it, you know, and I, I and, and you know, what's kind of fun is, is, um, uh, the, the new book, uh, actually I was speaking at a conference in, um, Atlanta, um, and, uh, or actually Savannah, Georgia, and the new book, um, we had some ship there from the conference and that was the first time I'd seen it. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, somebody commented on, you know, my facial expression when I opened up the book and that, you know, it was clear that I, you know, had a lot of joy in that. And even though it was my sixth time, um, there is something about that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Where should we, I just want to be the first one to thank you, John. Um, yeah. I've um, admired your work from afar for a long time and, and what you do. So thanks for, for putting all that out. I remember seeing in the bookstore duct tape marketing and thought it was a cool looking <laughs> cover. Um, yeah. Way back when I remember jotting a note, if you ever write a book, maybe I should look at that cover <laughs> for inspiration, um, not to copy it. But um, where should we point people towards online? Obviously, you can go to you know ducttapemarketing.com, check out all your books, your podcasts. Where else should we point people towards? Well, if they just want to, um, if they just want to find information about this book and hear interviews like this, other interviews like this as well, um, it's just selfreliententrepreneur.com, and as you said, duct tape marketing is D-U-C-T. T-A-P-E marketing.com. And of course, if, if you just want to pick up a copy of the book, they're available pretty much anywhere you buy books. Um, I always like to give a plug for that local community bookstore. Uh, hopefully you have one of those still in your town, but uh, obviously all the online retailers as well. Selfreliententrepreneur.com. John, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This is my pleasure. I love talking about this stuff, as you can tell. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.